Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to VMworld. I'm sorry. We're probably getting in the way of some of your lunches. Hope you got time to get some food in advance. Um, who was here for the graphics customer session this morning? Sort of curious. OK. Cool. Thank you for coming back. We didn't scare you off. That's good. <laughs> so I'm Pat Lee. I run the remote experience team at VMware. I'm working on graphics. And this is? I'm Luke Wignall. I'm with NVIDIA. I'm the manager of the performance engineering team. So we're going to go a little bit, talk about you know, Horizon with NVIDIA Grid vGPU today and talk about how, things you can consider as you go to deploy it. I do want to ask one question before we get started. How many people in this room have actually deployed virtual graphics in their environment already? Great. Glad to hear it. So uh, standard disclaimer, OK. So uh, I'm going to, you saw these first three slides a few times. How many people have gone to EUC sessions so far today or yesterday? OK, these first three slides you're going to see a lot over the next three days. Um, so I'm going to skip them. Um, there, I did them. OK, those are the standard slides. I'm just going to skip those. <laughs> this is the fastest presentation you're ever going to see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the reasons why people are considering doing 3D workstations in the cloud. Um, as we talked about this morning in the customer session, the, you know, more and more companies are more distributed. You don't have a workforce in a single location anymore. You're working worldwide. You've got offices. In Asia, you've got offices in Europe. How do you work collaboratively across that? Especially when you start thinking about the use cases will require 3D graphics. Especially because these graphics, the, the, the data sets are huge. You can have files that are to, you know, a half a terabyte in size to run a project. You can't easily move those files back and forth between those 30 locations. I was talking to a customer, and they were trying to move a file from Shanghai to Omaha. It was taking them 12 hours to move the file. Somebody to make one change. And it'd take 12 hours to get it back. Not a lot of productivity happened in that 24 hour period. Um, it was sort of actually funnier this morning. Um, a customer actually brought up the point that think about it this way there was two choices. Either we had something with a, a large amount of bandwidth, a FedEx truck, <laughs> we could sit the files in there and get there the next day, but the latency was really bad. And that's people are looking at VDI to help solve that problem. How can you collaborate at the same time with the same people worldwide? Um, Data leakage and security is a big issue, especially as people hire more and more contractors in this type of space. How do you make it easy to revoke access in a hurry and really limit their access to only what they need without letting your files go out the door? I mean, there was an article a couple years ago where not a manufacturer lost a computer going through the airport. A year later, that car showed up in China. And they had to cancel the project in the US. So these are big deals. Data leakage is a huge issue. And that's why people consider this. So you know, it's easy enough to put a graphic like that up and talk about those values, but we went, and if you were here this morning, you already saw the slide, and I, it was interesting because we pulled this from actual customers. Um, this data is real, uh, and yet the more we interact with customers and the more we hear their stories about these, these um, uh, call it cost benefits or whatever, the benefits of VDI and what it is they're finding, how it's changing their workflow, how it's changing the way that they do business, um, the more data we get, the more, quite frankly, the more staggering some of these results get. Um, I always pick on the farthest one, the 20%, because the real story was from a manufacturing company and the real value was 70%. And quite frankly, we sat back at NVIDIA and said, there's just no way. I mean, 70% of productivity gain is, I mean, that, that's a catastrophic disruption to workflow. If all of a sudden the beginning of your process is 70% faster, what's the rest of your workflow got to do to compensate? And that, in fact, became the problem for that manufacturer. And then we got to talking this morning with some customers, and they actually brought up values that were even worse. So uh, you know, the, I think there's, there's things that are being uncovered as we move forward with this as a solution, as we've opened up users instead of sort of the traditional knowledge worker workload, and all of a sudden all users have an ability to be virtualized, these benefits are just starting to pop up left and right. Um, another thing that we talked about um, off of this sort of a list is what were the business drivers that started your process? What drove you to begin to consider this in the first place? And we then said, what was the second thing? What was the third thing? Because customers will start with one piece, and then as they dig into it, they start finding out, thanks to that disruption to their workflow, there are other advantages. Um, you know, linked clones is really the story on the second one, right? Um, the middle one, collaboration. I mean, these should be obvious, but suddenly the distances start growing and you start thinking about how that changes the way that you do business. Um, the video training piece seems so trivial. It's just video. But when you're flying 5,000 pilots back to a central location to show them safety videos on aircraft so they can continue to do their logistics delivery job, not that I'm suggesting who it might be, 
and, um, and suddenly you don't have to do that anymore. That is a huge shift in cost and, and logistics for that company. And then last but not least, um, that particular story, that auto manufacturer brought this uh, story up and said, the ability to not have to actually send a drawing to a supplier, but hold that drawing back and maintain our ability to be competitive with suppliers, to force negotiations. I'm sitting there going, oh, so you're going to save a bunch of money on workstation costs. And they said, well, that's going to fund the project. The real benefit is the ability to save tens of millions of dollars per car project. And we're going to start three car projects in the next quarter. It's a huge amount of money. So that's what's forcing these things to happen. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> cover a little bit about Horizon 6 features for graphics. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to walk you through the last couple of years we've been on a journey with VMware Horizon to bring graphics into the world. So if you look at three or four years ago in VDI, were you able to deliver graphics to any of your users effectively? You weren't. It really didn't exist. It was sort of a pie in the sky fantasy. You were doing task workers, doing call centers. You weren't thinking about really graphics and higher performance workloads. And that's really changed a lot over the last three years. I'm going to sort of walk you briefly through the journey of where we've come from. So Windows 7 really started driving the need for 3D. If you think about it, Windows 7 is the biggest 3D application in the world. <laughs> Arrow requires 3D, right? Across the board, every Windows 3D desktop by default should appreciate what a 3D card can give it. So really driving that, we had to really bring, how do we bring the Windows 7 experience and even the task workers, how do you do that? So we had soft 3D, the ability to run a GPU and software. Lower scale, but at least can provide the experience. Very basic, got you across the line, really designed for those task workers. Next, VMware launched VSGA back in 2013. And VSGA allowed you to share a physical GPU uh, with a, and the better performance, but it's still more limited. It was really designed for the lower end use cases, Aero, productivity apps like Office, and some lightweight 3D viewers, because it didn't really support those really high end applications, didn't have the graphic support that you need to be successful there. So late in 2013, we released VDGA, the ability to take a graphics card and hardwire it into a VM. So you have all the capabilities that graphics card has to offer the world, all the latest versions of OpenGL and DirectX and encoding. And it was great for high-end users. If you were running super high-end apps and you needed the best, you could do it. It was great. Hard to manage, um, but high performance, really costly because it's one-to-one. -one. And then at this time last year, we announced we were bringing NVIDIA, NVIDIA Grid vGPU <clears throat> to vSphere and Horizon. And back in March this year, we, announced, we actually did ship it. And uh, how many people here were here last year we made that announcement? Great. So uh, it's been a great experience. It's been shipping six months now. And uh, for those who don't know about it, Grid VGPU takes the ability to take a single GPU and slice it up into multiple GPUs. It can be shared by up to eight users per physical GPU or 32 users per card in the case of a K1 or 16 per K2 today and allows you to be more cost effective while still delivering all those high levels of graphics capabilities that people need to run higher end applications. Did you ask how many people were in the early access program? I didn't, but you should. Uh, who, who in this audience, show of hands real quick, was in the early access program for a fair amount, actually? Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. That was great. I'm glad to see that. Um, so Grid VGPU has been out six months now. We had, the, we had some great customers on stage this morning talking about their experiences. and. Uh, and I guess that's really what we're, you know, as we move deeper into this, we're going to talk a little bit more about what NVIDIA is coming out with next. And I think you've got another button push to go yet. Uh, and what VMware is doing as well. But, um, you know, this is continuing to mature, right? We're continuing to bring in new feature sets. We're looking at how, I mean, we're listening to you all. And we're trying to figure out how to take back from you what your needs, what your demands are, and try to figure out the best way to, to, to build on this product and deliver something back that more closely meets your needs. So as we dive into this, we're not only going to be covering what we've learned from a POC standpoint and what our customers have told us um, and, and sort of offer that back at you. And then hopefully over time, you guys will give us more feedback. But we're also going to talk about what's coming. So that's actually one last question. How many people in this room are actually trying to deploy grid VGP right now? About a third? Is that about right? That's exciting. Sure. So, um, a new announcement this show for VMware is that we are bringing 3D apps and desktops to app promoting with RDSH. So back with Horizon 6 last uh, March, we actually announced that we were bringing app promoting into Horizon. We support app promoting in addition to VDI desktops. And with this release that we are announcing tomorrow, uh, we will be able to support 3D apps and desktops with RDSH in addition to VDI desktops. So if you just need to deliver a single app or two at need 3D, 
You now have that capability in Horizon to deliver that using a grid card backing that GPU, backing that VM. So, good news, yes. Um, dive a little more into the sort of the, the nuts and bolts. <coughs> we have so, any, why don't you run with this one? So, for grid GPU we talked about, right? Shared access to a physical GPU on an NVIDIA grid card. And one of the, the biggest benefit is is that you get access to those native NVIDIA drivers. And those native NVIDIA drivers have been proven in the marketplace for over 20 years to be able to have optimizations for every application that matters in the 3D space. I think it's important to note that the, the you know, and this goes back to VSGA, I suppose, but the ability to have our driver in it, I mean, if you know, if you've ever downloaded our driver, you know it's not a small driver. Um, it's really an app stack. It's something that we've worked incredibly hard with a variety of people from ISVs to, to vendors, you name it, that to create something that your software vendor can then lean on to provide the best possible graphical experience. Um, so our, our driver is something that, that to us we're extremely proud of because it's so critical to the, to the actual delivery of those pixels. Um, and so if you're looking at the architecture piece, that ability to speak directly between our driver and our hardware, which is necessary for that maximum performance, um, we do separate out channels so there's no crosstalk between sessions, so security is maintained. Um, and in the end, what we're able to deliver is that high performance that you would expect if you were, say, a Quadro Pro Viz user or what have you. And one thing that's also critically important because of that expertise and relationships with the ISVs are that we're able to now to provide an ISV certified solution based upon Horizon with Grid. So we now have the ability, we have um, official support statements from Autodesk, from Esri, from PTC and Siemens. So if you're running those applications on top of Horizon with Grid, you have an application certified platform, which is really important when you're running these high-end business critical applications that you need in your environment to have the support you need from those vendors on top of this new platform. Because virtualization is a very new thing for many people in that space, in the graphics space, because it wasn't even yeah. possible a couple of years ago. So being able to get there to say it's a completely certified solution is something that's critical as you go to make be more successful. Uh, so we just like I said, we're announcing uh, 3D for RDSH applications. Uh, we announce tomorrow, shipping shortly. And it allows you to take advantage of, if you have an RDSH host app or desktop, you can deploy, for example, Revit or AutoCAD or other applications and just have them show up just like any other application would, except being remoted with the power of a GPU behind it. And that can either be a grid vGPU GPU profile, or it can be a dedicated VDGA card, if you already have one existing to use, to deliver that. And it really works with uh, Windows 2008 and 2012 hosts to really deliver these apps. And if we had better network access here, which is pretty bad, I mean, it was going to yeah. demo it, but the network here was falling apart earlier today. Typical trade show, unfortunately. Um, but it really allows you. So who in this room actually be interested in running 3D apps with RDSH instead of VDI? Not too many. OK, but still, it's worth looking at as you start thinking about your app profile and needs and how you go forward. So who in this room uh, deployed VSGA? in the past? Who deployed VDGA? OK. So one of the things that's important, and then we have VGP, we saw a lot earlier. I think one of the things we want to give some people some guidance is if you already deployed VSGA, you know, why would you want to consider going to VGPU? Or if you deployed VDGA, why would you want to consider going to VGPU? And it really comes down to the fact that grid VGPU brings the best balance of benefits from both VSGA and VDGA to you. First of all, it's a shared resource. You can share it across multiple users. That gives you better scalability, better cost models. Um, it also has things like um, fully certified drivers, which we talked about earlier. That's something VSGA doesn't have and was a big downfall to VSGA. Couldn't support the applications you needed to run. Um, it also provides things like automated management. Now, one question we're going to get and I'm going to address up front is that does it support vMotion? No, VGP doesn't support vMotion. However, it does support placement. <clears throat> and it does support management, so you can actually automate all the entire scenarios with Horizon, so you can actually leverage across hosts automatically. If a host goes down, it will automatically reboot on other hosts. So all those things that you would want out of vMotion do come into play with Horizon, but it doesn't support vMotion directly. And um, it really gives you that best of both worlds environment where you can get you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 users on a server using just a couple of cards, which you couldn't do otherwise. So if you already have a K1 and K2 and you're using VDG or VSGA, it's actually pretty simple to upgrade. You have the ability to upgrade to Horizon 6.1 and vSphere 6. 
and you can take your existing K1 or K2 card you're using for either pass-through or VSGA and bring it into vGPU, which is the latest drivers, the latest software, you know, the benefit of moving things over. You need to update your VM settings to take advantage of vGPU, but it's a pretty simple process. And you then have the ability to take advantage of a lot more of the Horizon features, which we'll talk about in a second. You know, the difference in the show of hands, who didn't try VSGA or VDGA and started with vGPU only? Okay. This is good data, thank you. So as I was mentioning, Horizon 6 brings the simplified management. If you tried VDJ in the past, it was really hard to manage. You had to do one-to-one -one mappings. You couldn't use link clones effectively. You couldn't really take advantage of any of those things. So with Horizon 6 with vGPU, you can use View Composer and a link clone. So you can have like that single image case where you talked about 20,000 users on a single image update for Siemens NX. You can do that with good vGPU and Horizon 6. Single image across the board, take advantage of it, updating it, and it covers all your use cases. In fact, the only changes we actually made from a, a perspective of going from uh, Horizon, from, from VSGA and VDGA to Grid VGP was two screens. The entire UI changes were two screens, one in vCenter, one inside Horizon, that's it. It's not a lot of configuration. It's straightforward, it's simple. And under the hood, Horizon automates everything for you. The ability to say, I build a cluster in vCenter, and then I just point Horizon to that cluster as the source, and when it goes and allocates VMs as it needs them. So great, I'm done. That server's filled, it goes to the next server, keeps using them, keeps going, keeps using them. If one of the servers goes offline, the user goes to power on the VM, it goes to another server, finds a spot, and powers it on for you. So it brings you a lot of that automation and management to make this simpler for you to deploy. And some of the other benefits of going to Horizon 6 with vGPU is you can leverage things like app volumes, which you can use to actually package your applications to make it simpler to deploy them across your environment for application management. Here's a look at some of these very complex applications. It's really challenging to keep them up to date with the latest current patches and deploy them to everybody. But with an app volume with a single on restart, automatically apply, and they get the latest applications for them automatically. So I'm going to have a really yeah. talk about grid. So we talked about, uh, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, certainly we're listening to what you guys are pushing back and telling us from the field that, you know, here's what you need. And so we've certainly, neither one of us, uh, have been uh, asleep at the wheel and we're looking at, at what more at NVIDIA that we can do to provide you um, with benefits. So announcing, if you heard yesterday, um, our Maxwell architecture, you probably knew it had come out for GeForce or uh, Quadro and so forth, but now we're bringing Maxwell into grid. Um, unbelievable horsepower, and the net result has been so far with our testing this, you know, 2x. Um, the idea isn't that it's double the performance and double the scalability, that'd be a lot, but it is either double the scalability or double the performance, um, and we'll touch on this again in a minute. We're also adding Linux support as well, thanks uh, to VMware. Um, we've also got two platforms now in the sense that we have both MXM, so Blades, who here has been waiting for MXM and Blades? Um, well, ta-da. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this hardware. Um, if you're familiar with the K1 and the K2, and we actually took that slide out because we've probably beaten you to death with it over the years, but um, essentially what we've done is instead of the confusion, I guess, would be the, 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 the word between K1 and K2 and trying to make that choice, we're trying to narrow it down so that we're giving you that maximum performance in a card, in a data center ready card, right? So this is coming out of our Tesla line. Um, so these are the cards that we really abuse from a high performance computing standpoint. We're taking that quality with grid um, and delivering a single card and then we're gonna really begin to pry into that idea of a platform, that software on top of hardware and delivering a platform that's far more flexible. So now when you're, you're specking servers, you can spec it with an M60 or an M6, depending on whether or not blades are to you, um, with a tr just a ridiculous amount of horsepower. Um, you'll notice we doubled the amount of um, video RAM frame buffer. Um, so again, we're pushing towards that more users, more horsepower. Um, Anybody in here using ANSYS? Uh, how many of you that raised your hand have run out of frame buffer on a K2? It's odd, I've actually had a lot of people walk up to me and now none of you raise your hands. Uh, it's happening, right? People are pushing this stuff. Um, back to the comment that Pat made about um, SVGA and then VSGA, 
end users are not backing off on graphics, so we can't back off on graphics, right? I mean, we wouldn't, we're NVIDIA, but um, the idea is still we must continue to push hard against those performance metrics in order to deliver um, the kind of horsepower that people want. So um, some initial testing that we've done, uh, and all of this will be getting released as a, a series of app guides. Um, hopefully you've seen our initial app guides that we have out, Revit and Esri, AutoCAD just, actually AutoCAD is probably live right this second. Um, those app guides, as well as additional ones, are going to be refreshed, including the Maxwell hardware, so we'll have additional metrics there as well. Um, but just some, some real quick graph data around the ViewPerf 12 benchmark, uh, as well as our uh, first app guide was on Esri ArchGIS Pro. Um, and I will absolutely tell you that uh, hard numbers on the Esri side, we went from 16 to 32 users. This one actually shocked us because we did absolutely nothing but pulled out K2s, put in M60s, um, in a 2U Haswell chassis, and immediately ran it up to 32 users with a 8% performance hit. That's nothing for doubling the number of users. And that's a peak workload, so I wouldn't expect that to, to be what my end users would actually pull off that host. So we, I mean, th this, is, this is real data. It's not just marketing 2X stuff. This is 2X. Um, uh, the ViewPerf 12 side of it, um, how many of you are familiar with ViewPerf spec? How many of you use it as a benchmark? Okay. So the, the idea behind ViewPerf is we've scraped all the graphics out of high-end apps, take those calls, and use it as a way to really just beat up our GPUs. Um, obviously, we can't show you an 8-gig frame buffer example um, on a K2 or a K1 because it doesn't exist. Um, but that single user performance, our initial test showed us right out of the gate that we were going to see in the graphics-heavy workloads that 2x performance. Um, and then, of course, the part that I think we've heard the most complaints about over the last stretch, the ability to start using MXM modules and blades. Yes, blades have been there. You've been able to leverage um, you know, some of our other cards. Uh, you've also had uh, mezzanine cards and so forth to be able to run K2s and K1s, but you've all asked for that MXM, and, and we're delivering that. And by the way, if you want to go see a demo of this, HP has it in their booth. <coughs> and the NVIDIA booth, you should go see the NVIDIA booth. It's amazing. It's got this amazing tower. Is anybody impressed with the NVIDIA booth? We tried really hard on that booth. I mean, uh, if anybody wants to know the heart, what, what's really going on behind the scenes there, it's, it's actually quite staggering, and we blew the power supplies in uh, Building E twice as we prepped that thing, is my understanding. Um, this, to me, is the part that's so exciting because I think there was a lot of, of, of just like Linux, right? Linux, it's sort of a fringe play. It's an edge play. It's not important. And all we've heard back is, no, some of our most serious users run Linux. Some of our heaviest workloads are on Linux. And if you can't solve Linux, are you really solving my problem? So attention, time, and energy got yep. put into this. Yep. We have Linux. So by the way, how many people in the room would want to run Linux virtual desktops? Yeah, right. see? Yeah, nobody's used How many people in the room knew that Horizon supported them? Good. Glad to hear it. So, yeah, it's been supporting them since June, and now it's great with vGPU support we're adding now in this next release shortly. Which is awesome. So, the next piece of information. Uh, we want to put more energy in our ability to deliver that platform, so the software on top of the hardware. Our goal is to continue. Um, and I'm not saying that vMotion is going to be available tomorrow. It's not. It's a far more complicated thing to solve than you might imagine. Um, it's one thing to capture system RAM. It's another thing to capture 60 hertz refresh rates out of frame buffer and try to move that. Um, but uh, we are changing the way that um, our vGPU profiles work and breaking that into licensed user groups so that we can then begin to really focus on what we're delivering to those users, the amount of feature sets, the amount of horsepower we're delivering. Um, we also want to layer on top full-blown support uh, and maintenance uh, for our software. So instead of it simply being a driver, uh, which it was many, many, many years ago, and it's grown into a platform, now we want to take that the next step um, and turn it into a full feature set of software that we can deliver you ongoing feature growth over time and support it. Um, we think that's critical. And then at the base of it is, again, a data center quality GPU that you can order without having to think about how do I balance users and how do I distribute them a, a, across GPUs. Um, I think it's important to also say out loud that that doesn't mean the K1 and the K2 go away. Uh, we love those cards. Um, so this is simply adding on and giving you a sense of the direction of things. Um, 
So how that breaks down in terms of users, uh, you've probably seen our, our vGPU profile charts that we do, and really that's the end piece uh, on the far end, um, or near side on that one. Um, but this gives you a sense of what our maximum resolution, maximum displays, um, all the sort of bits and pieces. Everybody get your cameras out, here's your chance. Um, notice we're continuing to maintain a 512 meg uh, profile. Um, that density piece, uh, we don't see any, we have yet to see Windows decrease the amount of graphics it wants. 10 is pretty interesting. Um, uh, in fact, we talked about this this morning. I was commenting uh, with the customer panel that the amount of abuse that an, uh, a knowledge worker does to their workload, um, the speed in which they interact with all their apps, um, is something that I don't think we really focused enough on. And you'll see some more stuff coming from my team uh, around testing. And then one gig, two gig, four gig, those have all been there, and now eight gig. So that's why I asked about Ansys. They're the ones that really pushed us on that one. And then how that lines up. I want to make a sort of a, a caveat here. It's easy to sit here and go, OK, so uh, you know, virtual PC is an uh, office, because it's not on there. If I'm, a, if I'm a Revit user, or I'm an AutoCAD user, that does not, by definition, then make me a grid virtual PC or a knowledge worker, or whatever uh, user group definition you want to use. Um, you have to think outside of this and say, what is the, you know, how hard is that user beating the system? If they're currently on a high-end workstation, you're not gonna put them on a virtual PC. Um, on the other hand, if you have somebody that's, that's working on a virtual PC, there's no, way to, there's no reason to over-allocate all those workstation resources, um, right? That's the whole point of virtualization, flexibility, manageability. And so as we break these down and as our app guides continue to mature, you're going to see us start spreading out user groups into matrices that say, if your model size is X or the amount of workload you need is Y, then this is where in the area you might fall. But in the end, it takes your all testing your actual interaction with those end users to figure out um, the right amount of resources. Sizing. Sizing. So I think one thing that's important to realize is that when you're doing graphics VDI, it's not your, mo your mother's VDI, right? You're not trying to get 200 users on a single server. It doesn't exist, right? This is a very different world where density is going to drop immensely, and your CPU, RAM, memory are all going to go up on your VMs. Has anybody found, OK, has anybody tried to run 100 graphics users on a single server? Has anybody tried to run 50? OK, a couple. 30? 20? OK, so most of the people in this room realized that wasn't possible. But when we started going to these conversations a year ago, 18 months ago, customers were trying for things that the physics just didn't allow for. And it's really important to recognize that you have to plan appropriately for these workloads. They're very different than traditional BDI. It's still shocking to me how you'll, you'll look <laughs> at an end user that's running a you know, 3,000, 5,000, whatever dollar workstation and t try to figure out how to take 100 of those and put them on a single host. Um, especially when you've got dedicated resources that the servers aren't even, you know, the clock speeds and the core counts. Uh, the core count may be high, but the clock speeds aren't as high as what you're delivering at the individual workstation level. You can't compare those two. And, uh, you, you know, if you've been in any of my sessions, I've abused this a lot, but I will continue to say it, and that is a physical workstation is a race car designed for an individual driver, right? And we're building high-speed buses here. We're shared resources that are meant to support a lot of different users at once. Those are completely different animals, and you just simply cannot architect and benchmark, I might add, uh, as you would for a, that race car against a bus. It's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work out in the way that, that makes any sense for anybody. So here's some goal, high-level guidance to think about when you're thinking about your applications. Now, this is just a starting point. Um, it's all going to vary on your applications, your users, or use cases. But our goal in putting this together is to try to help give users really better guidance how to start off. So oh. first and foremost, you're using, you're using vSphere 6 because you need that for hardware v11. You have to do that. This is all vSphere 6 and above. Um, if you're on older versions, you're going to have to make the jump. You don't have a choice. And it's critical that you stay current on software. I get that it's hard and it's challenging to, you know, you, depending on, on your situation, maybe you have to do a lot of testing and, and validation before you can upgrade versions. But I mean, just you know, take it at face value if you have to, but I will tell you that our respective teams are working extremely aggressively to increase performance with every iteration. And one of the number one support issues we run into is where somebody has upgraded all but one piece, 
right? So they've moved up in every other piece and then they forget to upgrade. You know, maybe it's the, it could be the client, it could be the agent, it could be any part of that. But if you miss one and those are out of sync at the moment, that will have some interesting results. So we definitely recommend, we say two to eight VGP, vCPUs. Realistically, it's four to eight. Some customers can get away with two at the literally low end of using AutoCAD or a very lightweight route, you can do that. But at least, you know, four usually is the recommended minimum for almost any application you're gonna consider. Um, and go up to eight, depending upon, again, the application, maybe even more, but four to eight is going to be the sweet spot. Now, it's important to recognize that Haswell's made this better. Yeah. Haswell's been a major improvement over Ivy Bridge in terms of what the performance it can bring to these applications. So, as you're thinking about this, be thinking about you're buying new servers with the cards pre installed. And when you do that, you're going to get the benefits of taking advantage of the latest CPU as well as the GPU at that point. And understand what's drawing off that CPU, <coughs> right? It's, again, this is shared resources. So if you would have normally allocated a core for the OS, a core for the app, and, and you know, maybe a core for the delivery protocol, don't forget one for the, the graphics encoding, right? I mean, make sure that you have that plus one from our perspective, plus one for um, the graphics side of the house. So, I mean, at a AutoCAD, for example, Two vCPUs seems to work fine, but that's at a very simple catalyst style benchmark, very simple older model. Um, you're really not pushing the system very hard. If we start pushing the system hard, it's very clear that jumping to four vCPUs makes sense. Um, and our testing, our testing, and we have not seen this consistently with every environment, but again, there's, there's a ton of variables here. Um, Revit, for example, seems to behave best at four vCPUs. That doesn't mean that you're gonna see that, and I absolutely challenge you to go out and test that. But when we tried um, two, four, six, and eight, uh, we saw a slight decrease in performance with six and eight. Revit just begins spawning a lot of threads, um, and, and things just sort of bogged down. So again, test, test, test. Exactly, and RAM, you know, we got lots of rel rel relatively different recommendations. It all depends on your apps again. Eight. Six to eight gigs is likely going to be a sweet spot for many applications, but again, you need to test it in your environment as you go to roll this out. We do have customers trying to use it in digital post-production, and 64 gigs is not uncommon in that use case. Yeah. So we have oil people, and gas. again, oil and gas, another one wants even more than that. <laughs> um, and so then inside the VM, you have to install the latest VM tools, the latest VMware agent, Horizon 6.2 shipping later this week. Think about this, don't start over. I mean, get the latest version when you start on this process, and the latest, greatest vGPU driver from NVIDIA. Um, one thing that's important to realize that we highly recommend from a Horizon perspective is that we have this thing called the VMware OS Optimization Tool. And what it helps you do is that we have a best practices guide that we've shipped for years. And it tells you if you want the best performance, go turn off all these things in Windows because they don't make sense in a VM. Well, this tool automates it for you. You can go and select all these checkboxes. Instead of reading 35 pages, you can launch a tool, hit a couple buttons, and it does it for you. So I highly recommend checking that out because you don't need to run a lot of these things. You're running in a VM. And it's just additional overhead you don't want when you're trying to consolidate 15, 20 VMs on a single server. But at the same time, and this is, this is <clears> funny, because this is the difference between you know, VMware and VDI and NVIDIA and graphics and ultimately end user experience, right? Um, we're currently doing uh, some internal testing in NVIDIA and production environment. Um, and I think I asked this earlier in the panel, but um, who here optimizes their desktops by turning all that stuff off and simplifying that build? And like, you know, Another minute in every hand and here will be up. Um, you know, what if you didn't do that? What if the end users didn't have to sacrifice that experience and they got the exact same experience that they get when they go home to their you know, consumer brand laptop? That's adding a lot of load back into the system, but... Well, I think it depends on graphics or not. There's a lot of things that turn off true. that aren't just graphics. So no, no, there's that's more true. than error in those things, so it's important to keep in mind. So one of the biggest downfalls of VDI ever has been storage. Who in this room agrees that storage has been the biggest pitfall of VDI? <laughs> okay, it's consistent with graphics is even more so, right? I mean, graphics, you know, you probably get away with get delivering maybe under 50 IOPS to a lot of your VDI users if they're not the graphics today. That's a, not uncommon and sad, but true. I mean, I, I personally despise that. I'm used to, I hate, I hate spinning rust. I like solid state. I like fast. Um, but with graphics, these users expect it too. If you think about workstations, they're running multiple solid state drives. They're running raids of 15,000 RPM, you know, SAS drives. They are not running slow storage. So if you're going to move people into VDI for graphics, you've got to get them the storage that's the same as what they were getting before from a performance perspective. So really think about that you really have to give them, A, a lot of size, 
Some use cases you may build, you can't get away with a 40 gig user disk anymore, right? For these use cases, you're going to need a lot of storage. You may have to go to a terabyte. You may need that. You have to, so look at that, look at your environment, think about it. But then look at how you're going to look at the performance of it. So the good news is, and not a plug just for, v, for VMware technology, but vSAN does a great job of delivering these type of desktops. In fact, it's great for a POC because you can buy three vSAN ready nodes with graphics cards in them. And all of a sudden, you don't have to buy any storage. You can configure it all and just add more add more to you pizza boxes in to extend your environment. So it's definitely a great starting point. You can use you know, the SSD base with all flash with virtual SAN if you want to. Or we had customers with great success using Pure and Tintree and others. But think about picking storage that's appropriate for this environment that can deliver 500 IOPS per user. Well, and let's just say it out loud. And we had other slides that we took out of this that really hammered on CPU and RAM and other, other details. Right. But at the end of the day, if, if what you're doing is taking a retired server out of your you know, trickle-down lab to do your POC, what are you really expecting for an end result, right? I mean, what, what really is your end experience going to be? So this is not something, and again, this is not your, I said grandmother this morning, now it's your mom's VDI, but uh, it's, it's, this is, this is high-end users. They are expecting their race cars, so give them performance. Don't, anywhere, you know, it's sort of like, where do you want your bottleneck to be? Do you want it to be the CPU? Do you want it to be RAM? Do you want it to be, you know, where do you want it? Yeah. Or give it all of those resources and then adjust, and then adjust your nodes after that to mirror the kind of scalability and, and performance that you expect. So, the app guides. Um, who here has seen our app guides? I just to ask that question. One guy? <clears throat> Mike. <laughs> Let's get those URLs up. So, we've created these app guides. Um, I want to say it was PEX. When did we bring this up? PEX, yeah. Um, back in February. Back in February, we brought this up. Um, so, the, the question kept coming back to us. How many users can I get, fill in the blank, for the application for a host? So how many users of ArcGIS can I get on a host? Everybody asked us. Everywhere we went, that was the only question we ever got. Um, and of course, it answers the rest of the questions, because if I need to know what card to get or what server to buy or whatever, if I understand, if I, you know, if I build it this way, how many users? So we created these app guides. And the idea was uh, sort of uh, highway city mileage, <laughs> if you will. Um, I'm, not, I'm not in marketing, I'm sorry. Um, but the idea was if I have a peak workload, so the, the number on the left, that is inhuman, all my users march in at 8 o'clock, sit down, open up the app, open up a file, rotate, work, edit, whatever, close, save, go home. Right? And they all do it in unison. So they're all hitting the same resource at the same time, the same way. That is the worst possible way for that shared resource to be abused, right? But we need to understand that because that tells us what that edge looks like. And this morning I was talking about how benchmarking has really been a challenge. I didn't expect this. When I took on this role, I thought, you know, we've been doing Quadro forever. We've got all these great ISVs we work with. Surely we've got benchmarks. And the reality is we don't because the benchmarks are really all about max performance. I just bought a brand new workstation, loaded it for bare, I wanna step on the gas pedal till it blows, and that tells me what my peak ceiling performance is. That's great if you have a race car, but if I'm on a bus, I have to share this, I need to know when, the, when one person too many gets on the bus and nobody's experience is good anymore, right? So what's the floor of performance? Um, as I like to say, what is the slowest high-performance car you're willing to drive, right? And so we came up with these tests. We're working with the ISVs. Esri has a great um, tool that they can, uh, it's not something that's publicly available yet, but if you request it and work with them through their support mechanisms, they will in fact enable it for you. And you can run a benchmark against their Philly 3D model. Um, notice the lab host below. If you go by that host, whatever OEM, your favorite, and you build it, exactly like we have it, you will get those results running that test. And we've done it repeatedly to ensure that that's true. And then we went out to the field and we talked to customers and we said, does this even seem remotely accurate? And they all said, well, 10 seems a little conservative, 16 is about right, but my users are lazy, so I can really get 20. Perfect. <laughs> yep. And one thing about this is these are the K2 results. As uh, Luke said, maximum results be coming later. Yep. But the, the good news is that you know, we've done a lot of work in classifying and clarifying these workloads with K2 and, later, and servers today. 
On the Esri side, when we put the M60 in, a uh, pair of M60s instead of the K2s, the numbers doubled. Yeah. And the performance metrics were the same, which for Esri is a draw time sum of 45 seconds um, plus 8%, and you get to 32 users, and that's how we came up with those metrics. So it, it, these are good tests. Um, the way we do this is we essentially run scales of numbers of users against certain profiles, and we look for bottlenecks. <clears throat> so we're trying to do all of that legwork that you would otherwise have to do yourself um, and try to at least take all that mystery out of it so that then you can apply, like narrow it down to a point where if you buy that, you build that art, you know, you architect that solution around what you know about your environment that in theory, I hope, you tell me, if you turn the knob a little to the left or right, depending on your, your users, you should be able to narrow down very quickly and answer that question for yourself about how many users can you get per host. And so in this case, 43 seconds happened to be our hard line because we we're trying to stay under 45 seconds. That's a Esri metric, read the app guide, and it really goes into some detail about that. And so there's this range between 35 and 45 seconds that we felt very comfortable saying, as long as the profile stayed in that range, then that was an acceptable experience. And of course, we're putting eyes on the desktops. We're watching these, these tests run. Um, and in every case, you can see they all sort of hockey stick up at the end. And that's because either the profile was too small, and so everything dumped the CPU and created CPU thrash, max CPU, performance went to hell. Or the profile was big enough, but we didn't put enough RAM in. Or we did too few or too many vCPUs. And in the end, the performance suffered, and we climbed out of that region of acceptability. Um, we asked this morning, how many of you have in your uh, VDI deployments, your graphics uh, VDI deployments, have an established end user acceptance criteria to prove that your end users are happy with performance? There's almost the exact three Not people many. that said yeah, yes or exactly. yeah. um, We see this as critical. Because I can't judge this if I don't have an end user somewhere that says, what are you kidding me? 43 seconds. That, you know, that's like watching paint dry. Or on the other hand, they come back and they're like, 43 seconds, I wish I got 43 seconds. It takes a minute and a half to run this at my place, right? Um, uh, and for the record, we took the GPU out, ran it CPU only, and it does work. It takes 45 minutes, which most of our end users got up and went to lunch. So here's one on Revit. How many Revit users are people deploying to Revit? Great. One thing to know is that Revit is officially certified now. So I mentioned that Everybody earlier. Everybody catch? And AutoCAD are both certified. So the great news is if you call it as for support, it's covered. And this was one of the things that helped make the case, being yeah. able to show them this is what you can get using well-standard proven benchmarks. Is this useful? I mean, is this something that answers that question for you guys, or should we be doing it differently? Is it? Is that useful? Thumbs up. I mean, I can't do this without feedback from you guys, so otherwise it's just me being weird in a lab somewhere. <laughs> do what? How about video games? <laughs> video games. We're not going after the video game market with Horizon. If you want to do that, that's available. We're not, that's not a market we really... What about developers? Again, we're not really focusing on... Developers can use it, but I mean, in terms of like, you know, you know th th like for example, my default now, Grid... It locks at 30, 60 frames. It locks at 60, right? I'm just trying to bite my finger here because I want to go <clears throat> buy a shield console. And stop yeah. asking no. these questions. No, we can talk <laughs> offline, but yeah. So, so I wanted to answer that question. Katia, I'm starting testing. We've already started testing, but Katia is something that we're starting next week. Um, there's been a huge amount of pressure on us. Um, it's something that we want to work with uh, Dassault on and figure out um, how we can get them to that same spot as we yeah. did. Autodesk has been. Uh, just a, a, a long process of working through support and making sure that we could all meet customers' demands about supporting their products. And we, we honestly, we need to do that with all the ISVs. Yep. Um, did everybody catch, I mean, I'm just even curious if it even made the, the news, right? Um, the whole Autodesk support thing for AutoCAD and, and Revit? Ah, oh, man. Okay. Yeah, this is huge. I mean, the thing that bugged me, and we run out of time. Yes. God. Um, <laughs> was that you went to a website to look at what you're supposed to buy for hardware, right, a workstation, but nobody ever put in there how you're supposed to build a host and guests to run in a virtualized environment for that software platform. It just didn't exist. So we put that together, and Autodesk was wonderful. So one of the things we want to talk about now, and this is actually towards the end of the questions, I'd love to get your feedback on this, and this is uh, how do you get from POC to production? How do you really get through this process, right? Because 
How many people here are still doing like a proof of concept of this solution? How many people are actually in production and planning on scaling it? A lot more people in POC phase still. So how do we help? One of the things that we've learned in this process is how do we get people from, okay, I think I have a problem, to figuring out what it is, to getting through it. So we're going to sort of walk you through this. This isn't meant to be perfect. This is sort of what we think is an interesting blueprint. We've added it with the customers who we, we had in the panel this morning, but it would be interesting to see your guys' feedback. So the biggest thing we see, installation is not the issue. So does anybody remember, we, anybody hear about this thing we did called 60 and 60? Anybody heard about that? Where you can install 60 VMs in 60 minutes for 3D? We did this back in NVIDIA's GTC event earlier this year. <coughs> that was just the process of installing, configuring, and getting it up and running. And in 60 minutes, we got 60, 60 desktops desktop. spun up with grid, right? Installing vSphere, installing everything, we got it all. So all the stuff in blue here is what we did then. And I'm saying in a realistic environment, you could probably do that in three, two or three days, you know, taking your time going through it, setting it up right. That's not the hard part about this. The hard part is figuring out how do you get management buy-in? So how do you determine the business drivers, right? Who thinks that determining the business drivers is the biggest issue so far they've seen in getting this moving forward? Not as many as I thought. That, that's, I guess, good news. I mean, so wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Does that mean then that you had very clear points of pain that brought up VDI and brought up VGPU? I mean, show of hands again. You had a very clear point of pain that was getting resolved by this? God, we'd love to get this information. So yeah, I mean, so that's a big thing. Is like sometimes it can take a few weeks, sometimes it can take a few months depending on how big the company is to figure out What's the driver for me to really consider taking people off these beautiful, gorgeous $5,000 workstations that make all this noise and <laughs> generate enough heat that they have to have a different air conditioner in the building, right, for all these people? How do you get people off of that into something where I, I get this little tiny client on my desk and it doesn't feel big, it doesn't feel beefy, it doesn't feel like it? A lot of background there, but how do you get people off of that? Um, the next thing is like really determining the scope of what you're trying to solve, right? One of the things that we found a lot from customers during this process is they didn't figure out what the destination was. They sort of said, we're just going to try this, versus saying, I'm going to try a project for 20 users for this amount of time. How do you figure that out, and how do you figure out success criteria? Because in the end, you have to get buy-in on this. Moving to VDI, in any case, requires buy-in. You have to get people who are going to validate it and make sure they're into this. I was in a customer meeting right before I got here, and uh, they had this big problem that they would get low-end users willing to accept 3D, but the high-end users wouldn't touch it. They got the biggest, most vocal candidate person and they gave him the biggest, beefiest VM known to mankind to solve the problem. And he goes, I can use this. And he started becoming their biggest advocate internally. So how do you find people who would be naysayers and turn them into advocates to lay to go forward? Um, and then the end user acceptance criteria piece. I can't stress enough how important that we keep finding out that turns out to be. A simple voting process for an end user to say on a scale of one to five, I didn't like it, I did like it, what didn't I like about it? And getting them engaged in that process so that you're showing them progress. And then things like ordering the servers. They don't come overnight. This isn't Amazon, right? You're ordering servers with cards, lots of memory. It's going to take a few weeks to get through processes and get ordered, and you got to make sure you plan for that in your plan. Um, and then yet, in the meantime, you got to work with the infrastructure team, right? Because unless you own everything end-to-end, -end, you own your server closets, you have to work with your networking team to get a whole bunch of IP addresses. You have to work with the infrastructure team to make sure you can find rack space for this and power. So how do you do this in parallel to make sure you're not serializing the task to make it successful? Then your rack then comes in, in a couple days you can do all the installations. We can prove that. We've got a great deployment guide that uh, NVIDIA wrote about installing all this stuff. It's 200 and change pages that walks you through everything, installing vCenter, vSphere, everything. It walks you through all you need to do, and if you follow it, in fact, most people did in our um, early access program, they're able to get up and running pretty quickly. So we know that part's easy, but then you get through that. Now we have to get users testing. Right? It goes back to that. You've got to start testing it. You give them the apps they care about. And those criteria, right? You're going to have to like, run a pilot. You're going to want to constrain it. If you don't put a time limit on it, you'll never finish it because people will never figure out, is this going to be successful or not? So you know, run this pilot and figure out how do you measure the results? Is it? And I can't stress enough how many projects or, or POCs we've run into where, um, and, and I'm going to be brutally honest here, where a sysadmin who has never touched Katia, for example, uh, or Revit, or whatever that app might be, who's never interacted with that particular application is, is stuck having to judge the performance of it. And of course, they grab it and they treat it like a video game, right? They grab it and they rotate it at 100 miles an hour and they go, oh my god, it's, look at it, it looks like crap. And uh, you know, there isn't an engineer around them that's working with that app that way, not one. And you bring over that engineer, you sit him down and you go, what do you think of this? Uh, do we install this app correctly? And they go, hmm, and they start rotating, they do all their methodical work like they always do. And at the end of the process, the assistant sits back down and goes, oh my god, it's still broken. 
even though the engineer was like, no, it looks beautiful. Yeah. So it's, it's truly understanding the way that that app and that workflow works so that you're judging it correctly. And then from there, how do you present the results to management, get buy-in and move to the next phase, right? That's an important part of really getting the buy-in is having true user validation or not. You may have failed for various yeah. reasons. Figure <laughs> it out and go back and rejigger it. So is this framework helpful for this people thinking about this or not? I'm curious. So I mean, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how do we put some more meat behind this and like build tools that we can use to help you guys as you go through this process to make it easier. Yeah, I mean, the goal is, I mean, because the blue part, right, that 60 and 60, we legitimately did in one hour, 60 desktops, two teams, bare metal. It was, you know, it was definitely a carnival act, but it worked and it worked well. It's just at the end of it, I think everybody walked away and said, oh, great, this only takes 60 minutes to do. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, not at all. Um, and so we thought, well, okay, let's reset and say, how long does this really take? If it's, if it's optimal and you've got all the tools you need and everything you have, could you do it in this time frame? Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. And that's really what we're trying to get to. And so one of the things that we found out during this process is like, you know, I said that number three step, order us grid servers. One of the other challenges we found was, what do I buy? And the, the app guides are going to help, but more and more we need to help give guidance to you about how you order the right specs for everything because one small mistake can make a huge impact on your platform. So we've worked with all the major OEMs, Dell, HP, and um, all the others. And I want to talk briefly about a couple things that Dell does that helps make this a little bit easier. So they have what they call the WISE Data Center for uh, virtualized graphics for all. And these are basically certified reference architectures for three of their main platforms. The benefit is you get the reference architecture if it tells you what to buy, the full spec, right? So if you take that combined with your app guides, it's going to help you build those best practices to get up and running more quickly. So it's something to consider. Can you get a reference architecture from the platform combined with the app guide to make ordering easier and simple? And that's something that's really... Is that useful? Is that helpful? I mean, again, we're trying to figure out where to put cycles here, so... Yeah. Okay. It depends on, it depends on the platform. The 7910 can, for example. So yeah, if you want to go see Dell and HP, they both have great booths. Go talk to them. They have great people here talking. Both of them do. And the second thing that's more interesting, how many people here are trying to deploy for like under 50 users of graphics? So one thing that uh, Dell has is called this precision appliance for a wise workstation. It's basically two U box that's meant to support up to eight users. That's it. No infrastructure requirements. You rack it. They have a simple wizard to set it up. It leverages the horizon back end to deliver the experience, but you don't have to configure VC, you don't have to configure those things. It's meant to run in a standalone mode. But you can then take it as it grows and you can roll it into your bigger horizon deployment if you want to. But if you're just trying to get like a 10 user, 20 user department up, you can buy a couple of these, walk through the simple setup steps, and you can get up and running quickly. So it's definitely something to consider if you're looking at a smaller deployment. This is worth looking at for sure. So at this point in time, We've done blabbing. Um, One quick question. Uh, there's, a, there's a big debate internally right now about concurrency. I'd be curious, maybe just shout out some answers unless it turns into total hubbub. Um, what are you trying to achieve with your graphics users from a concurrent, concurrent number of users? In other words, if you, is it two to one, three to one, five to one, one to one? Uh, what are you trying to achieve? Does that question even make sense? Correct. So right now you have a room full of workstations and say 100 users. How many VDI are you trying to build to compensate, to cover for that? Because not all users use everything at the same time. Eight to one? All right. Four to eight to one, depending on user groups? Okay. Yep. I guess the question, let me restate it a little bit. How many users do you expect to have use that machine in a day, I guess, is more the question. Do you expect to have like four users share a single VM effectively over the, day, the power of the day? Or is it one to one? Is it like you're buying one VM to one user? One to one. So we've got five minutes left. If anybody wants to ask questions, please go up the mics, shout them out. I want to make sure we give you guys time. Yeah, please. A couple quick things. Who's here heard of the NVIDIA VMware test grid test drive? If you want to demo 3D graphics without buying a thing, go to nvidia.com slash VMware Try Grid and you actually get to connect to a Horizon-backed environment in the cloud that you can use to demo cool apps like SolidWorks, 
and AutoCAD, um, and NX, so NX is in there, NX and SolidWorks is in there. There's a viewer, but yeah. Um, and you can see these apps, and you can actually try them yourself. You get, you get an account, what? It's on a K2. It's on a K2, it'll, it'll be upgraded to Maxwell at some point soon. But for now, you can try it out, take these apps for a test drive. Very soon. <laughs> yes? There is no over-provisioning. There's no over-provisioning, but it's time-sliced access to all the cores. Yep. So essentially, because it's graphics, from our perspective, if you need all 1,500 cores of a K2, during your time-sliced session, you get access to all of that. Right. Um, you're done so fast because of the bursty nature of graphics that it can then hand off to the next time-slice very, very easily. Yep. Yep. If you're taking pictures, these slides are available. But this one talks about all the resource materials that are available, from deployment guides to app guides. Certification list for servers. So, question? Yes. Yeah, quick question. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the, the mezzanine card. Um, so, that's a Tesla card, which I, I believe is a more of a computational GPU. Um, when will you be releasing uh, more of the, the grid graphics, you know, real graphics rendering GPU to the mezzanine form factor? So, <laughs> Just because we put Tesla at the front, I mean, essentially they're the same GPUs. Since there's no output on the back of the card, um, you actually, uh, the way the Teslas are gonna be designed going forward is that the M60 is in fact a Tesla card. You have a choice between compute or graphics. You can make that choice when you essentially have originally configured the card. So you receive the card in the server, you can set it up for compute, or you can set it up for graphics. If you set it up for graphics, you actually get a second choice because you can always go to the, the largest profile size currently, and that profile, which is sort of like pass-through because you get all the frame buffer, will also happen, uh, will support OpenCL and CUDA. So it's not like you've shut the door just because you've switched from um, compute to graphics. Okay. Did I answer the question? Okay, cool. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was looking at your resources on the website for the under the grid stuff last week and uh, where it talks about ISVs and the different software packages. There's a whole lot more under the dedicated than there is on the shared, like um, AutoCAD's not even listed in the shared section. Does that mean that better have just been updated like in the last yeah. 15 minutes? Yeah, so like, like for I was example, AutoCAD there. got supported last Friday. So it's one of those things where things are moving. Things are actively being worked. Okay. Yep. Right. Um, where are these slides available? Uh, it's for all the VMware slides are available for any download. I forget exactly. Look at the VMware resources. Okay. VMworld, yeah. But um, if you have any questions, we'll be available up front to answer our name. So thank you very much for your time.